a non-dual teacher such as yourself and, and sometimes myself is really in a um, position of pointing to. It's like, notice this, see this. And so there's a guiding, really, of, of attention to source of awareness. Um, a therapist is usually meeting people where they are and, and working from there as well. And sometimes that is necessary, it seems. And, and yeah. often that's, it's framed as doing some reconstructive work, kind of helping stabilize the foundation and the nervous system before you can do the deconstructive work, yes. before there's enough of that stability and coherence yes. internally. Yes. And, and being able to discern that is important, I think, both for therapists uh, and for teachers yes. as well, to kind of know as a teacher when it's better to refer yes. someone for maybe complementary psychological work or preliminary psychological work before continuing. And, and that may be relatively few people, in your case, yes. who come. <clears throat> and for other teachers, maybe more. You yes. know, depending on who yes. they attract. And similarly with therapists, kind of knowing um, when, uh, when therapy is opening up into another dimension, yes. right? When, when the, the bottom starts falling out, you know, of the apparent separate self, and you find yourself in this openness, you know, to be able to say, you know, there's a teacher I know who could really help you, you know, or let's shift gears here and really pay attention, you know, to what this is, yes. the, and what, what the quality yes. of this emergent awareness is. So yes. a certain fluency, I think, yes. in most domains yes. Is, yes. is helpful. Uh, I like the way you describe the necessity sometimes for reconstructive work before the deconstructive work. Mm -hmm. In a way, I would say that what I do is first the deconstructive work and then the reconstructive work. And what I mean by that is that we start with this deconstruction of the notion of a separate inside self and, and a uh, separate outside world. We strip back, strip back until we get to the uh, raw essential being before it is mixed with thoughts, feelings, sensations. However, the recognition of our essential nature doesn't, in almost all case, cases, clear up our old belief systems and uh -huh. much more importantly our old feeling systems. It's one thing to know I am the open, empty space of awareness in which all experience appears, with which all experience is known, out of which all experience is made. But it's quite another thing to feel mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So the approach that I take is usually the deconstructive work mm -hmm. first. And then from that point of view, mm -hmm. we then revisit objective mm -hmm. experience, thoughts, feelings, perceptions. and undergo a process of realigning them. I think with, that's a better word. With our... Yes, realign that. Mm -hmm. With what we have already understood. Yes. So it doesn't apply, and this is something that's sometimes misunderstood in the non-dual approach, that we just do this deconstructive work and then there's nothing else to do. There's nobody here, there's nothing to do. That's the end of it. Mm -hmm. It's not the end of it. No. The feeling of separation outlives the recognition of our true nature. And there is still work to be done on realigning the way we feel the body mm -hmm. and the way we perceive the world in a way that is consistent with our new understanding. And I, this is a, tra a deeply transformative and seems open-ended process. And I, I think and it is yes. really important yes. um, to recognize that because many non-dual teachers will kind of stop yes. at this you know, open emptiness yes. and say, that's it, you know, yes. and yes. when in fact, Really, that's it, the beginning of a whole other process, exactly, transformational exactly. process. Exactly. Enlightenment is, at, at most, a halfway step. Yes. Hmm. And I think um, the, the beauty of what you're describing is that when people are in touch with their true nature in a really intimate way, uh, it makes the transformative process that much easier, yes. actually, because you're not approaching it as a separate self. You're yes. not yes. attached to or identified with it. And so um, there, there's an openness and an intimacy. Yes, it's a joyful cooperation. It's a joyful cooperation, yeah. generally joyful, sometimes a little we, we, rocky we, <laughs> for some a, of us. There's a lovely story, which I'm, I'm sure you know, of the um, Zen master on his deathbed, who was asked by his student, how are things for you now, master? And he said, everything is fine, but my body is having a hard time keeping up. Yes. That perfect, that, that response, it, the, the, um, the, the, the humility 
of that response perfectly sums up. Everything is fine. My mind is open, clear, spacious. My experience is flowing through it, through it leaving it untouched like a, like a bird flying through the sky. And yet there is a part of my experience, the way I feel the body, mm -hmm. that has yet to catch up with mm -hmm. my enlightened understanding. Mm -hmm. And that is, a, I think, a, um, a very wise but very humble and honest response. Well, this is it. It's the, it's the humility and the honesty and the vulnerability then. Yes. You know, the willingness to be with experience, whatever it is, no yes. matter how difficult. Uh, yes. And so from that open awareness, it's just so much easier yes. for that process. I think that many people in the 60s, 70s, most of us heard about the term enlightenment or awakening through our interest in Indian culture, Tibetan culture. And so we had this rather exotic notion mm -hmm. of what enlightenment or awakening is. And we thought it's the, it's the end of the journey. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it's not enlightenment or the recognition of our true nature that is exotic. It is India and Tibet that are exotic. Yes. But the recognition of our, even calling it enlightenment, is far too exotic a word. The simple recognition of our essential nature is not exotic. Everybody has equal access to it. But that recognition by itself doesn't magically put an end to the conflicts in one's relationships, the difficulties with one's children, the feeling of abandonment that has accompanied one since childhood. There, are, there is a need to explore all these feelings in the light of... Uh, of in, in the light of uh, uh, presence. In the light of presence, yes. in the light of our new mm -hmm. understanding of mm -hmm. ourself. Yeah. And that is something, as you said, that is not often drawn attention to either in the traditional approaches or in contemporary approaches to non-duality. And so in this sense, it's, it's, um, this is a tantric dimension. It's the tantric dimension, yes. Of, of non-duality. Yes. The sometimes referred to as embodiment or the awakening of the body. Yes. Uh, as yes. well. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The, the, um, the, uh, the approach that is emphasized in, the, in Vedanta is the is the inward facing path. What is my essential nature? Irrespective of uh, what's going on with my thoughts and my feelings. I, I am aware of my thoughts, but I am not a thought. Mm -hmm. I am aware of my feelings, but I am not a feeling, etc. This is the inward facing path where we focus directly on our essential nature. But then, as you say, the, the path that was elaborated in the tantric traditions is when we turn back again towards the objects of experience, towards our thoughts towards our feelings, towards our activities and relationships, and explore them again in context, in the context of our new understanding. So there are, it's the inward facing path that, that was um, best, most clearly uh, described in the Vedantic tradition, and then the outward facing path of the Tantric traditions, mm -hmm. yes. And I feel that a complete teaching must take both pathways. Must, must take both the inward-facing and the outward-facing pathways. And, and so we come back to working with the conditioned body-mind, that yes. so much of psychotherapy... Uh, you either yeah. have to do it before you recognize your true nature, or you have to do it One way or the other. You have to do it. Yeah, right, exactly. and so some, some initial work may be helpful sure. along the way, so yeah. that you know, it's not as rocky yeah. coming back, but yeah. one way or the other, yeah. and we re-encounter re that. It's a, a mixture of both. That's right. Um, depending, as you said earlier, on the on the um, intention and maturity of the the person involved. This is what I find. There's a there's a very kind of complementary movement be toward, towards being intimate with um, the contents of awareness and with awareness itself. And often there's just a natural kind of uh, movement back and forth as yes. each clarifies yes. as well. Yes. But I think this is especially important to emphasize um, that this is an inclusive approach and both transcendent and imminent as well. Yes. And so in that sense, there's a readiness for the pointing to true nature. And there's also growing readiness for this um, more um, tantric step yes. as well to, yes. as Westerners, I think, because it's important these traditions have come from monastic and renunciate traditions and we're trying to live them in our ordinary lives yes. in relationship yes. with, as human beings with feelings yes. as well. So this seems extremely important. Yes.